You join me in in a cart pulled by two horses. That is not a glamorous view. Anyway, yeah, so as you might be able to tell, we are in we're on the Cheyenne in 1869 route today. Why I decided to drive on this today, I have no idea. Anyway, this this totally isn't isn't the second time I tried recording this. Yes, I didn't just have Dad come in and say some, say how he got a scam call. Well, it certainly wasn't the f certainly wouldn't be the first time. But anyway, yeah, so I had done a decent intro, but of course it's all been ruined because of the unexpected interruption. Anyway, yeah, so as you might be able to tell, this is certainly quite a different. Well, this route is certainly quite different to what we you, well, what I'm used to in Train Simulator, at least. Uh, time period-wise, I think it's just about the oldest route we have in the game. Although, in terms of the age of the DLC, it's not the oldest. I mean, it's certainly not like the Somerset and Dorset Railway or Great Western Main Line. Or oh, heck, even Cajon Pass, which, I've, which I, I've never actually got. Well, I've never got that route before, and quite frankly, I don't ever intend to. Anyway, uh, I'm not really sure what, well, as I said, I was doing a good in intro, well, I felt I did a good intro, and, um, yeah, it all went to waste, so I don't know what else to say. Might as well just cut to the chase and show the engine. Yes, this is certainly quite an impressive looking thing, or uh, quite an impressive looking machine. I mean, it's made by Smokebox, of course it's going to be impressive. Although I think the cylinders could be a bit more shiny. Yes, as you can tell, this is the famous Union Pacific 119, which was one of the two engines that was present at Promontory, Promontory Summit in Utah. I think it was on the 10th of May 1869, which is about a month, well just under a month out from when I'm recording this video. What is that there on the dome? Well, it's obviously a man, but I'm not sure what he's meant to be doing, or what he's signalling to. Speaking of signals, I'm not I'm not sure if this route even has any signals. But anyway, as you can see, we've got a very small train with us today. Just three boxcars, two flatbeds, and a caboose. Or, as we call them in New Zealand, guards vans. See if I can get in the cab without it lagging, without a lag, great big lag spike. Wait, have I even got... Oh, I've got bloody pause brake on. That's why it didn't go in the cab. Anyway, here we are on the footplate of 119, which I can't blame you for not being able to see all that well. They obviously didn't have... This is 1869, so they didn't have the technology for... Um, they didn't have the technology for cab lighting back in those days. I suppose the only lighting you could have had in the cab would be from the firebox in the firebox. But anyway, as I said earlier, this whole route and this engine was all made by a developer called Smokebox. One, I mean, put it this way, well, his reputation is, like, quite reasonably good. Like, he makes quite good American steam locomotives, although, from what I've heard, he's actually English. Go figure. Anyway, um, why I keep, why I'm doing a close-up of the bell, I have no idea. Um, Yes, as I said, he's got quite a good. He's got a reputation for making some pretty good American engines, which I believe, I believe, one of his more well-known releases is the Union Pacific FEF-3, otherwise known as Union Pacific 844. I think I'm not exactly sure what else he's done apart from this engine 119 route or the Cheyenne route and 844, but recently he has released, I believe, the Promontory Summit route, which I haven't got yet, and I'm not sure if I will get it, to be perfectly honest. And, um, anyway, I should probably shut up and get this engine moving. Yeah, so I think I decided that, inst last time I did this line, the Camp Carlin branch, and this time I thought I'd go to this, what is it, I think it's the watering stop, we're about, I think, six miles east of Shane. You've got these markers along he along the route, like at mile at one mile intervals, which I think is is going to be useful for me at least. Um, yes, this might take a while because the engine doesn't seem to 
doesn't really... I'm not sure if this engine can go above uh, 20, 25 miles an hour. And, yes, this is an interesting system, what, what's happening here, the way you, where you've got the slider. I guess, as you can tell, I, th I think it's meant to control how... Um, what is it? I think, I think it's meant to control the level of uh, uh, the level of fire mass. But yeah, I'm a bit of a bit of bit ignorant when it comes to smoke box engines. But one thing I have learnt about 119 and her sister, well, not really sister, but the engine that sat over there. I'm not sure if you can see it. Well, I don't even know if I've got the cursor enabled, but um, well, to appear in the recording, but I'm waving the cursor around in front of the engine. You'll see it when we go by later. Anyway, uh, one thing about the, this West, this American, this 1860s American stock is that, as you can tell, it starts with the handbrakes uh, switched, well, not switched off, but the handbrakes on. So what you have to do is whistle to the, is do a whistle code to the guard, or brake man, or something. I don't know what they're called in the US, or conductor, which is like the most mainstream term I've ever heard to describe any railway staff. I can't remember, I think it's like, uh, what is it, a short blast, or a shorter, or the long blast, I'm not really sure. I think it's when you, oh that's right, that's right, it's then, um, what is it, two long blasts. Oh, so bear with me while I, uh, while I sort that out. <coughs> Should do the trick. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yep, it's working. That's, that's good. So I think as soon as the handbrake on the caboose is released, we can shove off. I think when you're on the move, if you sound, if you blast the do a short blast, that will trigger the handbrakes to reply again, which is something you wouldn't want to do when going up a gradient. Yes, I do have this engine set to simple mode, I guess, but, well, that's mainly because I can't drive steam, I really, really just can't drive steam engines in advance. Um, I'm not sure if any of you who's currently watching this video have seen the one I did, I think it was on the East Somerset Railway with Stepney. No, not Stepney with a face, I mean the real Stepney, well, uh, the train set version of the real Stepney. Um, I believe you can get step. I believe there is a version of Stepney with the face that's available for train simulator, but um, you know, I don't think I don't know if that's still available. Or where, well, I know where you can get it from, but if, what I under, from what I've experienced, the Thomas engines are train simulator, but well, packs. To be honest. One thing I haven't mentioned about this engine yet is the way the injectors work. Which is, uh, really quite interesting. Having, not having driven, because I haven't driven this engine in a while, I don't really remember how I don't, I don't think I've driven on the eastern side of the train before, uh, so I don't know. off like the a few of the additional textures so that so, so that I think it's just so that you can get a few additional frames and I think it's intended mainly for people with lower end computers like me for example 
and I say that, and yet, even when I do you try recording with, well, when I did do the Cardine on the Swanage Railway, that didn't work all that well. Yes, as you can tell, this is the other engine I was referring to earlier. This is, quite obviously, Jupiter. Livery, well, colours wise, I think she actually looks better than 119. So, as we're going, as we come out of Shiny, that's some sort of. Well, it's obviously a machine, but I don't know what it's called. Back over that way, we've obviously got like the roundhouse and machine um, with the two ways of coaches and some of things. Now, what, this is quite an interesting contraption. These, I think these are called ball signals, which I don't think, I don't think they were only a thing around this time, like in the, in the late 1860s. I think the way it works is that if the ball was raised, I think that means signal. I think that means the signal or the section head is clear, and if it's lower, then the opposite isn't. Because the thing wants to get out of the control. So I don't know how long this is going to take. Pilots, I think, for example. 
I would put the headlights on, but well, the lamp, I should say, but that would probably, from uh, what I've seen, it's having the headlight on does make it more fun, right? Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that this engine bears, well, yeah, I guess I would just might as well say it. This engine bears a reasonably strong resemblance to a preserved, or to a type, the type of engine that was built Rogers, well, the Rogers locomotive machine that was built for the New Zealand Railways in 1977. And I think they entered service in 1978. These are what, what New Zealand Railways well, rail here called Rogers Ks. do look very similar to these classic American 440s, except of course they're 242s. And I believe the reason why they were um, why they were designed as 242 is because they were designed to run between Christchurch and Meath in the south of the coast of the South Island. If you want to go first on side note, if you're wondering what these lines that these well they're not necessarily power lines are these are uh, like telegraph lines. Yeah, that was a, that's a pretty much an ancient communication to see the telegram. I'm still not sure exactly how it works, but in a few times I'll probably end up finding out. Go to the interesting way the firebox, the firebox tapers so sharply at the front. Normally on taper boilers it's a gradual slope down. That's the much of the Scottish Railway that's the Toro, by the way. And I just realised they're going to the UK here, so it's not expected. It's about five miles, well, basically, you know, it's about five miles an hour. So I'm not sure if we're going to go and have a go with the kids. Well, actually, we're going to take the other ones into the war on this one. So I think if you give one long blast while you're moving, you want to do it in the face. It's a bit difficult to spot, but look in there. Or look under the boiler. It's, it should, the engine's not moving, not working inside the steepest of the motion. I like the way the track looks on this route, and like where the how the sleepers are kind of jutting out from the dirt. Well, that doesn't really look like conventional ballast, does it? So that's another thing. Look at how basic the. <laughs> I always find it amusing looking at like these cabooses and the coaches um, side on. Look, look at that, like. Um, like all you've got, or, I mean, I think it just speaks for itself, really. I can't really think, of, think how to describe it. Why the engine? Why there's such a big cloud of smoke coming from the engine, despite the fact that the regulator is closed? Coal on fire. One thing I haven't shown you is the bell, which, not surprisingly, it is animated. Thus. That's normal for smoke box engines. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely one thing about it. Okay, if 
it. Okay, I just want that deep in this gear to detail with the firebox on the white vessel. Normally I think, uh, normally I believe engines that for some reason it's a magic block. Well, they actually have a firebox that's clear and a firebox glow. This gear is just one doesn't have it. Lower. I think it's a little store. I wonder if the caboose has a passenger field. It does indeed. One thing I said in the original, in the first take, before I even left Cheyenne, was that the. be a good situation in real life, I don't think. Yeah. It's not as bad as uh, like a blowback in a tunnel. That's, that's why, obviously, close the fire on the doors go through the tunnel. Yeah. As I was saying, so the Rogers case with those making some see I mean, from a distance, you would be given for thinking that they are just 440s, four but they're not. They are actually 242s. And what that means is, like, like look at look at 119 side on, and then picture the rear wheel set on the front bogey is not there. The driving wheels are moved a little bit further forward, and the trailing axle is under the firebox the cab. The reason, I believe the reason the Rogers K's were designed with a 242 wheel arrangement is so that I think it's, it would be better suited for the relatively hilly route um, between Christchurch and Dunedin. So I believe that's what they were designed for, the route they were designed for. Over the years they did end up, I think, I believe that was fun, I think they, some of them ended up in the North Island, but I'm not sure if they were clear. It certainly wasn't up around the road, but up around the Bay of Plenty. So I think the Rogers case were all withdrawn by the time the original East Coast of the section from like the line from Pailoa to Tolano opened, which I believe was in 1928. Yes, unfortunately the case did, uh, but did. Why I'm stuffing around with these sliding windows is anyone's guess. Man. But anyway. The strange thing with the Rogers K's was that um, instead of being scrapped, um, they were actually dumped in riverbanks as part of like an erosion scheme or something like that. There were quite a few obsolete steam locomotives that had that same fate. I think another example being the 4J class 260 tender engines that were converted into 262 tanks and despite looking very different to the original WA class were the, re the, J the rebuilt J's were classified as WA's and 
pictures of them are quite hard to come by, but if, if, if you are familiar with the way the, w, the original WAs look, like I am, you will be able to tell that the uh, J-class converts are a bit of a dubious, and, well, were somewhat dubious that we've classified as WAs. Anyway, uh... Uh, so, you, I think, I believe there are actually three Rogers K's in preservation, though, like, forgive me, please forgive me, because, I mean, I honestly, I honestly don't know how many of them were actually built. Yeah. But I do know that there are at least three that have been covered from riverbanks and are preserved, although not preserved in a conventional way. Uh, the three Ks in preservation are 88, 92, and 94. I believe 88 and 94 are at the Plains Railway near or just south of Ashburton. I mean, I know 88 different years. I mean, I've been to the, I have actually been to the Plains Railway and seen K88. Although sadly, she wasn't actually in steam on the day I went. Instead, they had a diesel rail car running, which, I, which is a Vol the type that's known as a Vulcan rail car because they were built by the Vulcan Foundry, I believe. Uh, and steam, that smoke is black and freezing. So I've watched a building tent painting recently. And that's one of the really old series that Andy Welsh Productions has done. So I just realised how far the Calcatcher extends from the front of the smoke box. Uh, no pun intended. I don't know what any of these valves are called, but it should tell Between 1900 and 1910, 
rip, rip replicas were built about 70 years later. Uh, so obviously that would have been in the 1970s. The replica, I believe the livery that Jupiter trains in the carriage is the same thing as the replica carries. But this livery, the 119 carries here, I believe that's not, yeah, this is not what the replica carries. The replica has a sort of a red, but this one is a bit of a uh, either way, I just realised I've hardly taken any screenshots. We're coming up to the end of the... Well, not the end of the line, but the end of this run. So, this might take a bit of time to get right. Um, yeah, that'll do. It's always nice to have the entire train... Well, the entire I say the entire train in the shot, but in real life it's often... Well, like around the highway it's impossible to... It's often impossible to get the entire train in one shot and it's just, it's just too long in a lot of cases. I mean yesterday, for example, well, the day before I recorded this video, I was uh, down by the rail bridge on St. Chapel Street, which is the, that's the road that takes a few links to suburbs of Lake Ultimate Lake, Namatua, I think, yeah, Pulitz Point, the width of the Central Carolina. And the reason why I went down to the bridge is because I had a tip off that apparently it was a DC going to Kinley from the truck with some sort of train. So I went down there, didn't have to wait too long, and then along came a Max Blue DC that's uh, 4663 pulling a rag of log wagons, which I'm still quite quite impressed about. That sort of thing is an extremely rare sight these days, especially in a line that's dominated by DLs. Um, if you're not sure what I'm on about, then go check. Well, actually, no, the cover, currently my new cover photo on my channel is one of the pictures I took of DC-4663 on the log wagons, but you could also, you're more than welcome to also see it on my Flickr page, the link to which is in the About tab on the channel. Anyway, so as you can clearly tell, we're coming up to the East Cheyenne East stage stop. And that's one thing that I find quite interesting, quite funny, but quite interesting about this route, is that, I mean, even when you're actually in the, in the Cheyenne Yard, uh, uh, you still feel like you're, you still feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so, I guess, well, I can, I can imagine why some people would want to have this route, because, well, again, aside from the buildings in Cheyenne and, and Camp Carlin and the occasion of these loops, there's basically there's basically um, nothing scenery-wise apart from seemingly endless uh, desert. Well, it's not desert. I don't think it's the plains. I don't know what the difference is between between a plain and a desert. But from what I understand, uh, the the area in Wyoming is generally referred to as a plane. I think I'm going to get a shot of 119 approaching this set of points with the bloke standing next to the lever which appears to be ra rather oversized or that could just be the angle. I've got the camera set too. Anyway, so we're coming fairly slowly into this loop. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I've acknowledged I quite enjoyed this run. I suppose it was a bit too easy since we were going downhill for most of the way and then the last little bit was level so there weren't really any challenging sections in fact I was actually worried that I was going to stall uh, which is the last thing you would want with an engine like this because this, this one seems to be so underpowered that you can't really start on the hill with any the train that's even any longer than this and even then if you manage to get the train this short starting on the hill you're pretty lucky of course, I imagine this is, that's how it would have been in real life, but if that's the case, then... Um, yeah, then... It, well, I would hate to be a driver on one of these things, put it that way. Anyway, I think... Soon. I'm not aiming to stop 
like right in line with the water tower. Now I'm not. I think this is like some sort. I think this is like a type of windmill, but unfortunately, I believe there are no. Yeah, there are no like creaking sounds, which I reckon. I reckon if there were, that would have made that. It would have made this route just that little bit better. Not that there's not. There's really um, no room for improvement. There's really no need to make any improvements. It, it is that good. Why there is a single tree in the middle of absolutely nowhere is anyone's guess. I, I, yeah, I have just noticed that. Anyway, that was that. Yeah, that was a jolly a case of jolly jaunts with Union Pacific 119. Hopefully you, hopefully you guys enjoyed it and. Uh, keep an eye out for more train sim videos as time goes on, and of course, real train re footage of real trains. And um, yeah, I guess, yeah, goodbye. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. And now for the obligatory whistle shot.